Next up, we're going to have a wildlife documentary, I think. The Elephant in the Web Application by Ivan Fosler. Ivan. Thanks a lot. Thanks you all for coming. Uh, and to the organizers and sponsors here. Yes, I, uh, I think about 10 years ago, I was working on a project, web-based project, of course, at that time in the world, everything in Python was done on Zoop. And I looked at all this stuff and I thought, really, we, we, it must be easier. I thought it was very cumbersome uh, and error-prone and also, uh, so on. And I sort of had a dream. I thought I can visualize this being done differently. I don't know how to do it, but I can visualize it. And I think that's sort of what programming is about for me anyways. If you can visualize the thing and you can make it happen. I, I don't know what uh, motivates other people. But anyways, ever since then, um, I've been working on this. I've been researching these things much more in the beginning. Because my research, I think, is a bit outdated by now. Uh, have been joined by my colleague Craig here eventually. And uh, we've been, by trial and error, doing all sorts of things. Now, I want to give you just the, the gist of that today. Of course, in half an hour, I can't really explain to you how things are done uh, in web applications in general. But I want to just give you the gist of that enough so that you hopefully share, uh, could share the, the vision uh, with me. So here's a quick outline. I want to run through what the typical web framework does. Where typical basically means Python. There are a couple of others in other languages. Uh, and a quick run through of what you'd have to learn if you don't know this stuff. Uh, for those of you who do know it, see it as a, a list, an inventory of uh, all the heavy stuff you know. Uh, a, a quick word then about cognitive load. Uh, and uh, then I'd like to indulge in an analogy with GUI frameworks. And finally, just talk about how, how I see this fitting into the rest of the world. So forgive me uh, for starting with the real basics. This is how the web works. There's a server and there's a web browser, right? And uh, typically, not typically, definitely always, the web browser would send a request to the server. The server would respond with some HTML document which contains all sorts of links for other things in it, like style sheets and JavaScript files, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that would also be requested. And finally, the job of this web browser is to render this thing in a in a nice way, according to what you said there, and also run the JavaScript in that browser, right? So that's where we start. Of course, from there on, the JavaScript can do other things and also do its own requests, etc. But that's the basics, and this is what typical web frameworks do. First, when that request comes in, the first duty really is this whole thing of mapping a URL to some code that you've written. The next thing is to take to execute that code, which probably would read something from a database, for example, get some data out of there. After that, it'll probably grab an HTML template, and I'll show you one a little bit later, and merge the data with that template to produce actual HTML. And lastly, the HTML would be sent back, as I showed just now. And that's the basics. Of course, with HTML2, all sorts of new things are coming, but the basics are, are always going to be there. The, the next thing that I think web frameworks typically have to worry about is how to deal with user input. So before we go into a little bit of more detail about that, this should work slightly differently. First, as before, this browser would request some HTML from the server, and it, this HTML would probably contain a form inside of it, which would have a couple of inputs. The, the only not document-like thing in HTML uh, are those inputs. And the user can then type stuff there, as you're well aware, and would typically use a different request to post this all of this stuff in text to the server. Well-behaved servers, not all of them are, should actually respond with a redirect after that so that it gets, again, a different URL which will give you the results of that uh, submission. 
and again the, the browser would, would do its thing. Now, the trick here, the first trick I think of any web application framework is to deal with the input that comes in, the user input. You want to make sure that they've actually, the user has actually typed something where you require stuff. You want to make sure that A's and B's aren't typed where you expect numeric data and stuff like that. So typically, the first step to deal with this would happen when you get that post request. You'd want to check there for this possible validation errors, etc. And uh, the next trick is when you do the next get to actually respond and say, well, here's a form with a couple of error messages like you've seen before with the input you supplied before so that the user has a clue as to what to do to fix this issue. That's a bit more difficult to do. Some people cheat a bit getting it right. Of course, if you have JavaScript, you can do a little bit better. And you can actually, in JavaScript, do some of those validations before this posting happens. It gives a little bit of quicker user input. Trick is, though, unfortunately, you have to do the validation on both places because anyone can switch off the JavaScript, for example, or circumvent it in other ways. So, so you really are tied uh, to have to do it in both of those places. The next big thing has to do with sessions. Now, the way HTML was designed, purposefully so, is that each subsequent request doesn't carry any data about previous ones. This was done for scalability reasons and so on. So it could actually be that a request goes, each of your requests in this little example goes to a different server entirely. So how do you actually know once you've submitted data and, and, and validated input, how do you know at this stage, or, or here you actually know what's happened and what the errors were in the form, when you get to render that form back again and you want to tell the user what these error messages are, how do you know what went wrong if you can't tie the, the two up? And that's the role of a session. Sessions, and I'm not going to go into the detail of how this works, but uh, typically you would store something separately uh, and there are ways with cookies and so on to, to, to send a little bit of info with the browser so that you can save something we call a session on this side and each time each of these servers get a request they'd be able to match up actually, okay, who, who are talking to me now and uh, deal with that. Then there's other stuff that I don't want to go into in detail Internationalization, I'm sure you know, it's got to do with all the messages or, or the text in your web pages. If we want to be able to render this for different languages, uh, then you need a way of translating all of those and to know in which language to display them, etc., etc. There's usually a bunch of static files that you want to just serve that form part of your application. And although people don't often talk about this in, in, in the context of web applications, you, you probably use an object-oriented design, which means you probably need an object relational mapping tool or something else to actually map this, to actually persist your, your program itself. And another thing people don't really talk about that much, although I've seen it mentioned at least uh, the talk before, is if you have something running in production and you've changed stuff that actually has an effect on the database schema, how do you deal with that? How do you upgrade the data that's there? Uh, most of these web frameworks also have a, a bunch of development tools to help you. So what would you have to learn? I've sort of broken it down in these four categories. They, they're, of course, basic tools. I'll run through them quickly. That's the stuff that most people do get to learn and, and know. There's also best practice. That's the stuff that most people get to ignore because they're under pressure. Uh, then there are a couple of recurring problems, not all of them always obvious. So I just want to mention one there. And of course, in the web, because we deal with different devices, different versions of things, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we, we get to have to deal with platform quirks things that work differently on different platforms. Perhaps one of the, the trickiest things, that one. 
The first thing that you'd probably learn is this, the server-side framework, which is the Python stuff you do that does this mapping for you to execute your code. And this is a very simple example from Flask. Uh, things, of course, get more interesting. I, I don't intend for you to read that code. The next thing, and this is my favorite because it's so ugly, is a template language. Can I just see how many people here know template languages? Ah, okay. So I'm not going to explain it to you. Just uh, take it in. Of course, that's going to generate your HTML for you. There's actually quite a lot of subtle things in HTML that, that, I, encounter, uh, that I see. People I encounter don't necessarily know, developers don't necessarily know about, and if, of course it keeps changing. And then uh, this is another favorite of mine. Uh, who are experts with CSS here just before? Oh, lovely, I thought so. <laughs> HTML, since it's really a document, to make it look like something, especially when you get to layout and don't just stick to, to colors and, and fonts and things like that, is really a dark art, I, I believe. It's, it's not programmer friendly, let's put it that way. Uh, I just have a bit of HTML up there to show you if you wanted to display a menu like this. Of course, you're going to have to decide what your HTML looks like you're going to have to write quite a bit more CSS than this to get it to display like this on all browsers. And this is one I'd like to stand still on for a little bit because this is sort of where everything comes together in a, in a way. If you take this little example, this is a, an input that you might have seen on many websites. It displays a label slightly grayed out on top of it. And when you click on it, it will clear that label so that you can type stuff. And if there was something typed, then it would whatever you typed would stay there, right? So there's a little bit of behavior here and uh, obviously a little bit of JavaScript. If you ignore, uh, if, if, if you'd have to do this yourself, here's a, a very degenerate example of how that will work. Once again, don't bother reading the code, just see that it's stuff. And it's not Python, um, by the way. What is interesting for me about how this works, and it most often works like this, is once again, you'd have to understand your HTML up there and, un and understand why you structure it in a certain way. CSS would be written so that depending on what classes are attached to these things, they'd be displayed differently. And you actually coax behavior out of this thing by in your JavaScript to actually go and add classes to the HTML so that you actually switch on and off different sections of your CSS to make it look different. That's obviously the one thing, one main way of using it. The other way is to actually change the HTML, which we tend not to do that regularly. But if you do JavaScript, you're probably going to use a library, something like jQuery, you're probably going to use uh, 15,000 plugins out there who've done a bit of work for you, which is uh, another story I'll, I'll say a bit more on later. On to best practices. I'm sure you, you all heard about accessibility. It's something that they have been talking about for a long time. So you, you'd want your web page to display normally for a person with normal abilities, you'd want it to display and work properly for someone who really has to make the fonts huge because they are uh, visually impaired, for example, or even screen readers and stuff like that. And there's a whole, this is a whole topic on its own that I'm not even an expert on. There's all sorts of stuff continually happening in this field. Uh, another one that people often ignore is this idea of graceful degradation. It's also called, or, or it's, it's twin brother is called progressive enhancement, if you want to go and read up on these things. It's the idea that you don't always know exactly what the capabilities are of the browsers that your users are going to be using, and you'd like your app to work no matter what's actually there. 
if it doesn't support a particular part of JavaScript that you're using, then you should be able to deal with that. And maybe instead of not working completely, your app should just degrade a little bit and still continue working. That's a tricky thing to get to done, uh, to do. I'm not going to, to go into detail through the other things here, just to say that there's a lot of them, my favorite being the security ones. And then I'd like to just say something about concurrency, because this is one of the problems that pop up. If you just go with this example, assume for a moment that we've got two users here with two browsers and there's a list of things in a database somewhere sitting behind a web server. The first guy comes, so, uh, requests a page, and this list is now displayed on that web page with delete buttons next to it. And let's say that the other guy now comes and does the same and obviously sees the same list. If uh, person one here now actually deletes one of the items in this list, it gets deleted in the database, of course. So what do you think happens when the second person now clicks on that same button? And how do you, do you deal with this issue? There's something called uh, optimistic locking that people used to deal with this. But this is one of the, the trickier problems that you need to think about, uh, that, that frameworks don't necessarily always support uh, in, in obvious ways. There's also a whole horde of possible security issues that you need to be aware of. For example, if, if you're logged into a site and someone else can manage to coax you into doing or your browser into doing stuff on that site after you've logged into it, then obviously they'd be able to do whatever they want with your privileges and not necessarily with your knowledge. So there are a couple of other things that can make life cumbersome here. Uh, we talked about internationalization. I've, I've often come across scenarios where the tools and the way you internationalize your template language, for example, might be totally different from how your one jQuery plugin works, for example, and your other jQuery plugin works, and multiply this by a couple. So those are the things, uh, that's something that's for me a bit cumbersome. Also, when you start worrying about who's got access to what, uh, what's readable, can I might be able to not click on a button that should be grayed out for me based on something, whereas you should. If you start building things like that, uh, it can get a little tricky. Uh, this brings me to what I actually want to say. Uh, so that's, that's sort of web frameworks in general. What's sad for me, though, is that what you actually want to achieve it's something simple like this. You care about the user interface that you're going to provide at the end of the day. But I think that you, what you build and what you as a programmer are confronted with is this times 100, a bunch of different files in different languages with different conventions uh, with all kinds of best practices that you're not necessarily an expert on or, or want to be. And uh, I feel that the cognitive load of this is just unnecessary. I think we can do a lot better if we don't have to deal with this. So, off to my, my little analogy with GUIs. And I'm, I'm simplifying a bit. Typically, we, we would have a monitor, right? Which is composed of a a matrix of little colored lights, if I can be that simple, connected to some other card in your computer that actually maps each one of those dots pretty much to an address in RAM. And you could say that your program is a process which could write to this block of RAM, and if it writes a particular color at a particular address, then the screen would know to display uh, to, to light up that light in a particular color, right? And I think this is a fair comparison 
with web frameworks in a certain sense. Imagine for a moment, I know they don't work like this, but imagine for a moment they did that GUI frameworks would give you a command like this. Some object, and you can tell it to write at to some other location the, a color, which let's say is a hex number. Just imagine how much effort it would be to write that H. You'd have to think about that algorithm. But that's not what GUIs do, uh, GUI frameworks do for us. They actually have total, very, very high level abstract constructs that they allow us to work with and they take care of all these details for us. Uh, my favorite one is fonts. So you have fonts with which you can write stuff on the screen, text that looks different, that size differently. We've got windows with title bars and controls in them. We've got menus, we've got buttons. Those are the things I think in terms of which you'd like to think. Uh, and I think they're obscured by everything that we have to deal with in the web. So here's the dream. Imagine, I don't know if that little bit of code makes a bit of sense to you. Imagine you've got something called a, an input and you wrap it with another one, which we call the label over input. And it gives you the example that I showed before with all the behavior that, that, that goes with it. Uh, a label that disappears and you can type stuff, etc. Imagine you can do that without any of this JavaScript stuff, without any of the CSS stuff. That's what I'd like to be able to do. And uh, this might be a bit more difficult to imagine, but imagine that the standards actually change after 2014. Uh, they actually did in the past in this particular example because this sort of thing is now actually natively supported in HTML5. If you had to write all that HTML all over the show in many different places in your application, are you gonna go back and change it all if the standards change? If you have a framework that gave you all of that, and the framework brings a new version out in which this is done according to new standards, maybe supporting things more efficiently, uh, that's a bonus, you get it for free. That's, that's roughly the dream. I quickly want to switch to to Python web framework world and I, I know that they're not all on here, but I think these are the ones that, that are, are very prominent and that little line is a timeline, by the way. We, we sort of started off in the Python world a, a journey of discovery with these things that, that, that started with Zoop. Moved on to Django, mostly. I suppose, and a bit of turbo gears, depending on who you speak to. Nowadays, people have gone for simpler things. They, they love the word micro framework because what these micro frameworks do is just implement a part of the problem, but they still all focus on dealing with all the things that I've shown you today. And I really think that uh, we need to step up. Others do in other languages. Again, I don't have all of them on here. In the Java world, we, uh, where a lot of stuff happens, Java has a lot of momentum, right? Uh, there are two interesting projects, Echo and Wicked, but you'll see they've been going for a long time also trying to accomplish this. Perhaps the, the best known framework that tries to move in this direction is Google Web Toolkit, where you can write everything in Java, sorry, and it gets generated for you in JavaScript, sorry again. There's a very cool framework as well in C++. I was quite, I actually fell off my chair when I discovered that people write uh, web apps in C++, but they do. And this is a very, very interesting framework in C++ that's close to what we're doing. You, you might also be aware in the Python world of a project called Tosca Widgets. They've been around for a, quite a while. They also try to get there, not the entire problem, but they're, they're trying and then obviously after a lot of work uh, behind closed doors, we've actually released what we're doing at the end of last year. So what's there is hopefully slightly more than a dream now already. Uh, it's something you can use. Just a word of warning. 
we we have been at this for 10 years and it's part time yes but there's a reason why it's difficult to make this jump from where we are to what I'm trying to sketch here. And that's if you look at the GUI world, it's pretty easy, actually. You, you have one machine, you have one process on that machine in which you can declare uh, something like a button, for example, and hold on to it in memory while it's being displayed. And once that process ends or whatever, nothing needs to be displayed anymore, and that's where your worries end. In the web world, things look a little bit different. We have multiple servers. We have concurrency. We've got multiple web browsers that serve to you at the same time. Some of the execution of this program happens on these servers, and some of it happens in the browsers in JavaScript not to speak of the security concerns and, uh, and all of those. And, you know, those big pra best practices that uh, we like to ignore when under pressure. So it's really a very, very different ball game, and I think it's a very difficult problem to solve. But I think it's solvable, and uh, I think it would be fun uh, to get there. That's it from me. I hope so too. <laughs> um, well, let me tell you that uh, programming for me is a lifelong uh, learning exercise. So I'm pretty sure in five years from now I'm going to look back and say what I did there is really bad, you know. But we try our best. Uh, we're not focusing on speed right now. We spoke focusing on speed of development and getting the vocabulary of this thing sorted out. And I, I don't think something on this level will ever perform with something on a lower level. If you, but if you want to program in assembly language, you know. Uh. Yes. Uh, a bunch, they're, they're scattered throughout the web in various different languages. They all seek to, you know, deal with this perceived issue of, you know, the, the scattershot way of web development, which is like a valid issue. Obviously, on, on one hand, you know, developing in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and a whole bunch of other different technologies is quite schizophrenic. On the other hand, my experience of, of looking at these different frameworks and experimenting with them and in various different languages has been that although they, they aim to like reduce the complexity of development, a lot of them just tend to shift it. So instead of going from, oh, you're working in a scattershot you know, combination of HTML, JavaScript, CSS, instead you're working in a, a, a kind of a model of, of, of of the web browser, which doesn't really reflect how its layout engine works, the various issues you get, you know, between different browsers and so forth. So, I mean, I understand the the concept. It's it's definitely a, like a an interesting concept and a cool idea. But on the other hand, it seems like it's it's extremely hard to achieve, like in the perfect way. Uh, do you guys have like a real a strong vision for getting past? you know, the issues which seem to have like essentially pretty much played every other framework of this nature whereby they essentially replace one complexity with just another complexity which isn't really simpler, it's just different. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'd grill you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Um, I said it's not an easy problem to solve. It definitely isn't. We have, I think, we have thrown away everything we've done at least two or three times and started from scratch again. I think, so there's a lot of stuff I can say about that. What I can say 
is what I see happen in many other frameworks, two things perhaps. One thing is they try, if, if I say I want something that works on the same level of abstraction as the, the GUI frameworks do, then I don't mean it must look exactly like they do. And, and I see a lot of those frameworks do do that. I, I, I think that's a mistake. I think we want something on the same level, but we need to figure out what it should look like. Uh, so number one. What was number two again? It'll come to me. Um, uh, what I also want to say is something about strategy. We realized, we also had uh, you know, ideas about, oh, maybe if we build this, it'll work well. And then we built it, and we actually had a couple of clients using it, and oof, it was difficult. You know. And what we learned from all of that was we needed a different strategy, which is not uh, come with preconceived ideas, build it and see how it works, but rather grow the thing organically from the ground up. And we started by building a website and see what are the actual commonalities there, refactor things out and learn from that. So we, we, we tend not to actually build anything, any infrastructure for something that we don't actually use and have a use case for. And... Uh, we go through lots of iterations. It's for us a slow and painful process, really, to, to keep changing things. So what I can offer you is that strategy. Oh, and number two that I forgot earlier. I, I really do think that because this problem is so complex, you really do need to frame it in a different light, which is what we're trying to do. No, I'm sorry, I, I haven't looked at that. Thanks. So, well, layout is one of the areas that I think we, we've basically demonstrated that with what we have, we can influence layout. But I don't particularly like what we have at the moment. So that's an area where we definitely need to improve. Uh, I, I'm also kind of concerned for the, the Python world in a little way. Everybody is jumping on Node.js and wants to do everything in JavaScript. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to have to retire when that happens. At the sorry, thank you. Um, at the helper classes in um, web to pi uh, web to pi framework, where uh, effectively they've got little, um, well, uh, they, they they effectively for an for a uh, for an anchor tag they've got an A uh, and an open bracket and then they go um, whatever they're anchoring to etc cetera, etc cetera, as arguments to that function. Sounds very similar to what you're talking about, to a point. Is that correct? To a, uh, isn't that just a different way of writing HTML? That's exactly the sort of thing yeah. that I came across. Yes. Yeah. It's no, it this is very to different to that because yeah. what uh, what we want to do is to say we don't care about HTML. We care about the widgets that you want on there. All right. Um, was you, you were speaking earlier about your your uh, work with Zoop, um, the Zoop formlib and schema classes, Do you s is it more along those lines where you define a schema and tell it to render itself? No, we, we don't automatically render things from a schema. We specifically, the schemas that we work with currently are done with declarative on, on top of SQL Alchemy. And um, if you want to build a screen, you actually build it with actual widgets, so you code that. Uh, it's of course possible to add a layer on top that that does some introspective on a, a, a introspection on a schema and renders something like that for you. But I think that's a secondary thing to think about once we've solved the very basic problem. All right, and uh, don't you think you're introducing perhaps another problem in that, in addition to having to know HTML and JavaScript and CSS, we now also have to know about this widget library. 
I'm, I'm hoping that you only need to know about the widget library. In other words, not have to know about HTML or CSS or JavaScript at all. We, we, we're there. Uh, obviously, we need to mature and be able to handle more complex things. But I think the, the basic stuff that's there uh, is there and, and demonstrates this idea. I just want to say quickly, sorry, uh, we, we do have a tutorial tomorrow where we're going to just go over very basic stuff on our tutorial that is on the web, actually, but just for those of you who'd find it easier to, to have someone around when you play with that stuff, just to show the concepts. So uh, it'd be nice to see some of you there, and if you can bring a machine, uh, do so, so we can actually write code. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's not a GUI toolkit, but it's on that level of abstraction, yes. Okay, perhaps I should reverse here a little bit. Uh, the example that I showed you here, that little piece of code up there, that's actually how you would write uh, let me just get this pointer. That's actually how you'd get this input onto a screen. So, well, in, in other things, I see that you have to write HTML to get this done. And perhaps in a template language where you perhaps include things and uh, you might reuse things like that. But there aren't a lot of frameworks where you'd have a text input class in Python. The, the other thing is this little Python input is actually behind it. We hide HTML, CSS, and basically anything you can do on the web. So. If to make this work, you needed another URL to be added on the server side with a picture in it or whatever, that's, that happens for you. You don't need to be aware of that as, as a user of that widget. And that, that's something that I think is quite powerful that I haven't seen elsewhere. Typically, uh, many of the JavaScript stuff, for example, will just be JavaScript. Or it will require you to do a lots of other things in other places as well to make it work. Where have you seen the last bit? On, on, the f on, the, on the forms, the Django forms. Not exactly, but I can see how you can feel that it's similar because it, it uses... Look, in, in Django, what it's really about is to at core, maybe the same things. It needs to display you something on the screen, and you need to say how, and it does validation for you, right? This actually doesn't have anything to do with validation. We've got something else called fields that's more in line with that. But uh, in, in Django, you can't do complex things. This is a simple example that I have up here for you. In, in This is where it would stop in Django. In real... Everything you write will be Python, and everything will be composed of these widgets. doesn't matter if it's, I think one of our examples on the web is a, a tabbed panel, you know, where you've got, can switch between different tabs. That is as simple as this.
Correct. Correct. Yeah. Plus also a little bit of what these things are able to accomplish for the user behind the se the programmer behind the scenes. Yeah. Sorry, too. We have this. We have similar aims. We have a very different implementation in that we don't generate JavaScript, and also um, Git actually model the the Java code that you write very much on exactly a GUI framework, and so we don't do that. Well, obviously, if, if you're prepared to go the extra mile and learn more about how the framework works, you can write these things yourself. But it would require a, a different, another level of, of learning. Sorry, there. The, the fact that they chained like this is probably a little bit misleading. Uh, we don't do it often. Typically, you would have a widget, and to compose it of others, you will add another widget to it, so that it has children widgets, and that's just how it's being composed. It's, it's useful in, in certain situations, definitely. There's, of course, a whole uh, bunch of Python code behind this, a whole model behind this that you can learn to write your own widgets. We're, we're also hoping that if people want really weird things that they'll come to us and ask, you know, don't you want to build a widget for me that does this because I don't feel like climbing the learning, learning curve. Sorry, uh, as someone just asked me, can I just say this? Uh, I have to plug the Gauteng uh, Python users group. They, they're trying to get together. Uh, they actually instigated us to, to support Python 3 recently. So thanks, guys. Thank <laughs> you.